Welcome everyone to the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. This is the fourth session of Art Gottlieb's lecture on the 20th century by decade part one. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this program, the Friends of the Library. Now, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Art Gottlieb. Hi everyone, nice to see you. Uh, right up front, I just need to tell you that I have, uh, since Tuesday, I've got myself a pretty good cold going on here. And uh, so that's another good thing about a Zoom presentation. And I have um, kind of a scratchy throat. So I'm gonna stop and take some of my liquids. Um, for those of you who were with us last week, um, brings us up to the year 1930. And um, it, is, it is hard pressed to fit the events of the 1930s into an hour and a half. So, um, I'm going to skip around a little bit about the things that I think are the most salient. And if anybody's got any further questions about it, just let me know. I'd be happy to expand if I can on any of it. So here in the 1930s, we begin where we left off with the stock market crash of 1929 and the impact that it had on us here, certainly domestically. Um, you know, I used, I used the, the analogy or the reality last time of the F. Scott Fitzgeralds running around, you know, with their cars and, you know, and their mansions on the North shore of Long Island, driving back over the uh, 59th Street Bridge into Manhattan and partying all night um, in, in very, um, what seemed to be a really libertine period regarding morals and sexuality and um, uh, women also. And the stock market crash, of course, by 1930 had had its impact. Um, two buildings that were built that you're familiar with, the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building, um, one opening right after the other, um, 1930 into 1931, Empire State Building was derisively called the empty state building uh, because there was nobody there to rent it. So what seemed to be a hot speculative commercial real estate market turned out to be going in the other direction by the time these buildings were completed. Now, of course, the Chrysler Building was more of a a private affair being built by Walter Chrysler himself um, as a gift to his children. Uh, the M Empire State Building, so large, in fact, that it had its own zip code. Well, that remained empty um, and it filled up. It took a while for it to fill up. So this has international ramifications, as we're going to see play out um, around the country, obviously, and in Europe. And um, we still have, until FDR is elected, um, and he comes to become the president, of course, in 1933, we have Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover now is the face of what has just happened, right? And, and we see this in politics today as well. Um, whereas, you know, the question is if something happens during a, a certain period of time where a certain president is president, does the president get the blame for it, even though that you can make the argument that it wasn't particularly his fault, you see? And this is something that's as true today as it was ever. Now, in the legacy standpoint of things, in my growing up, um, there was this aura around Franklin Delano Roosevelt and conversely, less of an aura around his predecessor, Herbert Hoover, right? Because Herbert Hoover was the guy who represented this, as we spoke about last time, these laissez-faire, leave it alone, the market will correct itself kind of politics. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a bit of a savior 
in that he changed the role of the federal government into that of something more benevolent, right? And that's generally the way it's seen in the, um, I mean, I don't know if the teaching of that has changed or not, but that's certainly the way it was in, around where I was in my house. And um, so was Herbert Hoover a bad president, right? He's still president, 31, 32. He actually, many of the New Deal programs, or at least several of them, uh, had their beginnings under the Hoover administration. Uh, but as we mentioned last time, nobody had ever really seen anything like this. This is the first kind of market bubble that we ever had that actually popped. And um, whereas today we look back on these things, I remember, as we discussed last time, during 2008 in the Great Recession, um, well, we had depressions before, right? So what have we learned? What do we know? And how do you want to move forward? What are the good policies? What are the bad policies? Who gets bailed out? And who's allowed to actually drift away and drown? And um, these are things that the discussions of which started a long time ago. Um, frankly, you would think that they would be some better predictors of such events today. Um, even if you follow politics at the moment, everything is so highly politicized, it, it's hard to shake off the partisan blame game one way or the other. And it really affects our kind of contemporary uh, analysis of practically anything, because you have to drive yourself away from the polemics of it, uh, which is very difficult to do today. Um, Herbert Hoover was a very decent guy. He was very decent. I'm not here to be an apologist for Herbert Hoover, but had it not been for the Great Depression, uh, or actually the stock market crash and subsequently the Great Depression, Herbert Hoover would have been remembered quite fondly, I think. Um, he was an engineer. And as an engineer, did you ever talk to an engineer? Any of you engineers out there, right? I mean, it's it's not it's not light party conversation, you know. I know a lot of engineers, you know, and it's kind of like the you got the gregarious people who can kind of like you know, I don't know, make a lot of small talk, you see. And despite what I do for a living, which is talking, I actually despise small talk, you know. I'll bring my wife with me places so she can make the small talk, and. Um, and I like, even in my, in my counseling sessions with people, I'm like, can we get to work, you know? And as an engineer, Herbert Hoover, um, certainly in the infancy of radio, he was not a big overt personality. You know, he wasn't somebody, <laughs> he was somebody who, uh, who spoke, in ways that were pragmatic, that were intended to problem solve, you see? It wasn't there, he wasn't like a retail politician. He was a businessman and he was an engineer. He was a mining engineer specifically. And he had gone around the world uh, to actually um, you know, be an expert in how to extract minerals from the earth, et cetera, uh, in various places. And um, he was really very good at what he did. So the reason why he became our executive, our chief executive, was because by the time that he reached the presidency, he was considered a person who was so efficient in solving problems and that's what he did. He solved problems, or at least he thought he was solving problems, right? And there's cartoons of him and there's like piles of paper all around him. And he's, you know, he's taking care of stuff one after the other, you see? Now, the point I'm getting at is, is that we have kind of a shift in our world, and I mean our world, uh, right around this period of time. And it comes with mass communication. Mass communication in the form of radio, of course, right? So radio back in 1930 was like, I don't know, 
social media today, right? It was the first time really you had a mass audience. Uh, and a mass audience means that you standing in front of a microphone and you're talking and millions of people are hearing you. I mean, that, that never existed before. You see, now over in Europe, the person who actually recognized the power of such a medium was Mussolini to begin with, you see. And then later on, Hitler took his, um, uh, looked up to Mussolini and took the cues of it. Now, what me Mussolini realized was that if I have some propagandistic message, right, um, I'm going to speak to a captive audience and I'm going to limit what else they can hear and I'm going to maximize what I'm telling them and wrap it in all sorts of stuff that's going to make everybody feel warm and fuzzy and then I'm going to control everything. And it's funny how that first recipe is remarkably unchanged. Um, now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he came in, he was the first person, and before that, during his campaign, to actually, as a retail politician, right, you hear this term retail politician, which means that you're, you know, that you can press palms and kiss babies and speak to people on the ground level, you see? And that was something that FDR was a natural at. You know, he was gregarious. He had a good laugh. He knew how to make every single person feel like they were being heard, you see? And people loved it. Um, and, and one of the mistakes that happened with Hoover is Hoover just didn't, not only did he not have that personality, he didn't think he needed to have that personality, you see? Um, Hoover was there to do a job and administrate the government and to solve problems, right? And Franklin Delano Roosevelt was there to be your uncle. You see, he was there to make it sound like we have the term that we toss around today called, I feel your pain, you see? And FDR was the first one who was able to just naturally have the instinct to be able to do that and use the mass media to do it. You see, so it's not that Hoover was a bad guy. It's just that the comparison between one to the other was so great, you know, and whenever you have a comparison like that, it really, it shapes reality, uh, whether we're consciously comparing, uh, making a comparison or not. Uh, another good example later on, right, just to make the, just to make the point was um, Harry Truman versus FDR. Right. FDR being who he was and everybody loved him. And the guy was president. You know, he had been elected four times, taking us through the Great Depression, taking us through World War Two, dies on April 12th. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 1945. And then you got Harry Truman. Which most people saw as not having the right pre uh, pedigree for president, and he didn't have that. You know, the kind of like that thing going on where he could just spontaneously chat about everything to anyone, you see, and that comparison was very important. Now, on the on the front end of it, back to our time period, that comparison between Hoover and 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 um, FDR was dramatic, you see. Now, Herbert Hoover. Um, He's worthy of his own program. Um, so many of the things that started off in the New Deal actually were Herbert Hoover administration programs. Another thing that slammed Hoover, by the way, as far as politics is concerned and events concerned in our own country, was that once the stock market had crashed and the, um, the Great Depression had actually taken hold, right? at the last year of the Hoover administration, there were people who had served in World War I on the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF, under Pershing, right? And not everybody went to serve in Europe. 
right? Um, you might have heard me mention before that Eisenhower was never, he was never sent to France. So uh, never in combat. The only combat president, by the way, we ever had from World War I was Harry Truman. And, no, excuse me. The point I'm making here is that after the war, after World War I, in 1919, 1920, Congress had offered a bonus to members of the American Expeditionary Force and said, we are going to hold a certain amount of money for you. And when I, geez, there was some future date. I think it was like 1940 something. We're going to give you the bonus. All right. And, and it was, I don't know, 1500 bucks or something like that, which I guess if it's 1930 and you're destitute was a fortune, right? So what you had, and you've probably heard this term before, the bonus marchers start in California and sort of in this really grassroots way amassed this tremendous populace by the time you went east to Washington, D.C. in a march on the Capitol, in a protest on the Capitol. And there were these people hanging around the Capitol and on the Capitol steps and protesting and on all the rest of this. And they had taken over Washington, D.C. and it became a big problem. And what the protest the bonus marchers is what they were called. What they wanted was their bonus. They don't want to have to wait. They want it now because it was owed to them. It was promised to them. They want it now. And it became such a bad optic um, that the police force wasn't enough. And of course, a lot of people were sympathetic to the bonus marchers. And then Herbert Hoover had to get the Pentagon well, not the Pentagon, because the Pentagon didn't exist yet. They had to get the military to come in and kind of like say, you know, you got to get out of here and go home, which, of course, turned into photographs of little shacks being burned down and and valiant World War I veterans being rousted by an uncaring government, you see, and all of that landed on Herbert Hoover, as far as you see that Herbert Hoover doesn't understand this. He doesn't care about us. He doesn't care about anybody, right? And that was another thing that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was actually able to capitalize on by making a comparison and saying, I feel your pain. I care about you. A bonus marcher thing is is, is un underrated as far as its effect on the death knell of the Hoover administration and the kind of optic that runs in mass media, which every politician since has used to their own benefit. And um, by the way, it was uh, Douglas MacArthur who was in charge. And, uh, you know, I mean, you could speculate whether or not he really minded rousting soldiers or not. So, but it was a terrible optic for Hoover. And of course, FDR wins in the landslide, 1933. And it begins a new era of American government. All right, what else happened? Um, so 1932, we got a couple of other things happen here. And, um, you know, it seems like a small thing, but it's not really a small thing. The Lindbergh baby gets kidnapped, right? Who cares? It's a big deal, you know? It's a big deal. And the point is that apparently we like our palace intrigue. We like, you know, it, it's, we, we, we're almost like um, looking at royalty, right? The question I always come to as a psychology sociology person is you know even though we're not great britain and we don't have a monarch do we really need a monarch you know somebody who fills the position of this paternal thing that we look up to and we revere uh, charles Lindbergh was really the first celebrity superstar 
and um, he was like a rock star, Lindbergh. 1927 flies across the Atlantic Ocean by himself. It's the epitome of like this, this American rugged individualism, American technology and all the rest of that. And it's a longer story than that, of course. And then Charles Lindbergh's baby gets kidnapped, right? And um, that's a story in it, in it of itself. It was this German guy from the Bronx, by the way, that grabbed the kid. And, you know, he was going to exact a, um, you know, a, a ransom, right? As it turns out, the guy, I don't really think he meant to do it from what I've read, but the guy dropped the kid, probably broke his neck or something like that. And they found the child buried in a shallow grave. But the point I'm making is this riveted the country. This was front page news, one end to the other on the airwaves, one end to the other, you know. And so we're in a new era now. As I was introducing to you a moment ago, we're in a new era of like this sensational journalism and sensational news reporting. And where we have our national heroes now, right? You got your bad guys, you got your good guys. And it was really a big deal from that standpoint. Um, also in 32, uh, Amelia Earhart. Now we have a female aviatrix, aviatrix, if I may, flying solo across the Atlantic. I mean, my goodness, that was a big deal. A guy named Mr. Carrier invents air conditioning. Now, from a technical standpoint, you would have to admit that that actually changed a lot of stuff. Right. I mean, if we didn't have air conditioning from the standpoint of freezer compartments and refrigeration, then how could we even have coal, a uh, uh, fresh food being delivered to our stores? See, so this really changed a lot of things. You usually don't think about it you know, too much. You know, I worked in a lot of World War II construction ships and they were they were. Um, the submarines that we had in World War II were completely air conditioned. And it wasn't for creature comfort. It, it actually made our underwater vessels much more survivable from a reliability standpoint. Because when you've got, you know, 80 sweating guys inside a steel tube, you know, at 300 feet, you might imagine the kind of condensation that's in the inside of the hull. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, right? And then every single thing in that boat, and submarines are, you know, kind of affectionately referred to as boats, even today. What was happening to Japanese submarines and German submarines is that they were constantly suffering from all of these electrical shorts and corrosion, right? From the incredible amount of moisture that was inside the hull. And the air conditioning by virtue of the fact that it also dehumidifies actually solved that problem. I know you're impressed. You just don't want to say it. Enrico Fermi, if you know who he is and his experiments with splitting the atom, a pretty big deal a pretty big deal. And we're about to find out how big a deal it is going to be not long from now. So in 1932, two leaders come to power. One of them in Germany is one Adolf Hitler. And he becomes the chancellor and then actually merges after uh, he merges the the position of president and chancellor into one. Uh, so combining his power into what we effectively call a dictator, and uh, or the Führer, as he would presume, the leader, right? And well, that was a big deal. 
you know, and people are looking over over to Europe and, you know, you might imagine how we see world events today, you know, looking at different places. You've got your own problems right in front of you. You've got your own stuff going on in your own country right in front of you. And yet again, it's kind of like, all right, well, that's important. Right. But what did people think about Adolf Hitler here? Um, well, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, remember, we still had a lot of first generation German Americans. Right. And um, so. I don't know, maybe Germany is not so bad, maybe German nationalism isn't so bad, maybe people here in the United States who felt as though Germany got the wrong end of the stick by the Treaty of Versailles thought that it was good that Germany was able to regain a sense of nationalism and military pride. And this guy, Adolf Hitler, sure, he's a little nutty, but maybe he's just the guy to do it. And more importantly, um, Adolf Hitler has a policy where the communists had to be stopped. Right. And we were of the opinion that the communists had to be stopped. You see, so maybe that's a good thing that mid uh, the mid continent has this major power that's going to create a bulwark against something we call communism. You see, so, you know, and this thing with the Jews, well, you know, come to think of it, I don't like Jews either. You see, you know. Um, Judaism is something I don't have to tell you, even from recent events, has always been something that's been kind of like a bit of a hobby here in this in this country and other countries. And uh, probably the thing that doesn't get talked about much in these regards, having nothing to do with Judaism, is <clears throat> the prejudice against Catholicism in this country. Right which is something we'll get to some other day. Uh, that's to become an issue when John F. Kennedy becomes president. And, and now on our side of the pond, so to speak, you've got FDR who comes in and people are looking at him like he's our guy. And it's a different thing now. He's talking in a different way that politicians never spoke before. And not only that, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt is using the advantage of radio to communicate with people, you see, in a way that no other American president ever had. Excuse me for a second. So for FDR, radio becomes key. And um, later on, right, speaking of John F. Kennedy and Nixon, television becomes a primary thing because ever since we had that debate between Nixon and Kennedy, well, it's kind of like a staple, right? It's important. We want to see what they look like. We want to see what they're going to do in real time in front of us. You see, so television becomes a big thing. And then of course it's the computer. And then after that, now, it's social media, God help us, right? So for back in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's day, he started having these things called fireside chats, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, I've got a pile of them. They're actually pretty interesting to read if you've never read any of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's fireside chats, okay? He really, he reaches out to people in this very personal way. And it's, it's kind of like you can imagine, you know, mom sitting there and she's got her knitting or something and you got that big old Philco radio, right? Those ones, you all know what I'm talking about. Everybody's grandma had one. And um, it, it was like in your living room, you know, people were in your living room and dad's sitting there and dad probably looks like Archie Bunker. He's got his white socks on, you know. And so, and you're listening to some a politician speak to you that you've never been spoken to like this before. Like, like he's the the before this presidents were. I wouldn't say that they were aloof. It was almost like it was like somebody you never expected to know, somebody you never expected to hear the voice of, somebody you never expected to see. 
And um, the idea of the federal government and the president was almost this kind of like mystical thing that, you know, regular Joes like you and me could never really attain to or even deserve to be in the company of. And here now you've got Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he's very good at this because, after all, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and he's part of the Roosevelt family, which you might say is kind of a, pr a privileged clique. And, uh, you know, very, you know, East Coast silver spoon sort of thing. And but he has the ability to make everybody feel like they're now going to be included. And here is where politics shift forever in this country. And you could pull a direct string from this moment right to this moment, that moment to this moment. So, you know, even when I was a kid um, and I would go and I would out to South New Jersey to visit my, my grandparents who lived in a, what was then a, a very rural place, right? Dirt roads, this sort of a thing. It was, a, it was very exciting for a kid like me from an urban environment, you know? animals right and um and the thing about the people out there was that they took care of each other in a way they were all poor my grandparents were poor their neighbors were poor certainly by today's standards and and they took care of each other they did everything for each other you see and and here's my point to you i distinctly remember Right now, this must be in the 1960s. I'm thinking about, and um, nobody wanted any handouts for anything. It was a big stigma that came from getting something from the government. Right? I mean, that was you. You're a failure. You're a failure as a human being. You're a failure as a neighbor. You're a failure in society. You're a failure to your culture. It is like we take care of our own. Thank you. We'll figure it out. And it was a very strong sense of this. And um, that was all about to change, one bit at a time. It was all about to change. And what FDR did is he came in and he assembled a, his own little dream team of people who were going to change the role of government as it applied to the individual, right? So whereas beforehand, under the 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 triad of republic administrations before fdr who were like all right well it's government's job to stay out of your business almost the opposite happened with franklin Delano roosevelt fdr made the argument that <clears throat> the way that our constitution is written and the way that our social mores have been regarding this rugged individualism and government is there to stay out of your you know your your business it's obsolete right it's obsolete and and it really has no place in the modern era and certainly by 1933 it was the modern era between large corporations uh that we have seen in, in the, the latter part of the 19th century into the early part of the 20th century and then afterwards to post-war years world war ii years things were so voracious as far as business practice was concerned that people couldn't really compete or really in a fair sense take care of themselves anymore you needed the government to regulate everything so that you would be protected. You see, so here is something that still remains right to this very day, right? A distinction one way or the other, and let me make the distinction. And so to fulfill government's role of assuring that people are able to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, does that require government being out of your way? Or does it mean that government has to advocate on your behalf? You see, so if I was to say, well, you know, I can't pursue the liberty that I want because I'm so regulated, I'm so taxed that I can't do what I want. 
that would be one argument. That would be a conservative argument, perhaps. Right now, uh, on a more progressive side, you would say, well, government is so uh, not government rather, but big business is so voracious. Right. And I'm going to get screwed left and right by nefarious actors who have drawn me in, you see. And technology has become so much that I'm going to be used. Then, therefore, I'm not going to be able to achieve happiness or pursue happiness because there are too many evil forces around. And therefore, the federal government needs to take the role to create regulatory agencies across the board for my protection so I don't get taken advantage of and I'm looked over. So therefore, now I can pursue happiness. And that is the same exact distinction that remains today. It's the same distinction that remains right to this very moment. You see? And it, my point is that it started right with FDR. I mean, I don't know if he sat down to decide to do that, but that is way actually he articulated things. He articulated this like, well, we we it's not, you know, 1870 anymore. And, um, you know, the regular individualist is a thing of the past. The federal government must step in and the federal government must take the role and the federal government must expand in size so that we can regulate whatever we feel like regulating. Uh, under the same guise that we have to protect you, whether you think you need protecting or not. You see? It's the same exact argument we have today. Same exact argument today. So you got people who are like, you know what? I was doing fine before the government knocked on my door and said, we're here to help. You see? And um, see, and that's, it's amazing how this, it's literally a direct string, right? And, um, you know, I find stuff like this fascinating from a, you know, political standpoint, sociological standpoint. And so Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, we had a very interesting um, fireside chat, right? And, and the purpose of the fireside chat was to reach out past Congress, the other two branches of government, right? The judiciary and also the legislative branch, right? So now FDR has a tool in his hand where he is actually going to get on the radio and he's going to talk directly to the American people. And he's going to make an argument to the American people that his New Deal programs, several of which ran up against the Constitution of the United States, because the Constitution is a limiting document um, where, in this case, where it says that, well, you know, the, maybe the president has a good idea here, but the, but the Constitution does not grant the executive branch this kind of authority. If you want to get something like what FDR wants to do, go and make a law, you see? And, and FDR was chafing at the bits that a number of his, his, his programs, actually the Supreme Court shot down and say, sorry, buddy, you can't do this. It, you have exceeded your executive authority. And it pissed FDR off. And what he did was he went to Congress and he got Congress on board, you know, because every FDR was so, everyone wanted to write FDR's coattails even the Republicans at the beginning, you know, it's like, is this from FDR? Here, I'll sign it, right? Because you wanted to make it seem as though you weren't being an obstructionist to the very popular Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And you didn't want to want, you were already smarting from the pain that the Republicans took because of the bad optics on Hoover, you see? So you needed to align yourself with Franklin Delano Roosevelt to be popular, because after all, your first order of business as a politician is your own survival. I'm sorry, is that too cynical? And so the thing is, is that Congress would go along with FDR, but the problem was the Supreme Court justices, right? And he makes this argument to the American people via one of his fireside chats, and he says, you know, the federal government is, it's just see it as a team of horses. 
the three branches of government. You got three horses pulling this, I don't know, stagecoach in one direction. I think he called it a wagon, whatever. And he says, oh, now imagine that one of those horses wasn't pulling. Two of the horses were doing all of the pulling. Now, does that seem right to you? You see, so FDR actually reinvents the concept of the three branches of government, saying that for proper government, all three branches should be in unison and doing the same thing because, well, in his opinion, the executive said this is what we should be doing. And that's the way effective government should be working. You see, up to that point, and still for many people today, um, the Supreme Court doing what it's there to do, presumably to rule if something's constitutional or not, is what it's supposed to be doing. And if it just acquiesced to FDR so everyone would be in agreement, they wouldn't be doing their job. You see, so the definition of separation of powers changed right at that moment with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You see, so if one part of the government, be the Congress or the judiciary, actually isn't pulling and doing the work of what the executive wants to do, then therefore they're blamed as being as failing down on their job, falling down on their job. And certainly we've got enough of that going around now. If you've got the constitution that is, you know, standing in the way of this, that, or the other thing, is that obstruction? Is that partisan in nature? Or if you're just agreeing with or going along with what the predominant people in the uh, government are saying, well, then everything's hunky-dory now, you see? So the separation of powers problem comes in big time with FDR, you see, because he, he chooses to redefine it. And very smartly, he goes to the American people to do it. Because, see, this way, the executive is not, he's not, um, challenging that separation of powers exist, but he's not doing it. What he's doing is he's getting the electorate to put pressure on the congressman, their constituency, and then that's going to do the president's bidding. You see, so with mass media, you've changed the entire political dynamic because you can go directly to the American people. And this is a very powerful tool, and it's become a it's it's a it's an even more powerful tool in its in it in our own time right now about what a candidate or a president can use unfiltered by the press to go straight to the American people, and if that is effective, how do you censor that or silence that or take that ability for you to hear this away? Today we have old teams of people saying, well, we need to figure out what misinformation is. And we, the government, are going to do a job and prevent you innocent people from being told things that aren't true. Now, of course, what makes the government more trustworthy than anybody else in this regard, but that trust in government, that benevolency that we're here for you starts right here. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was, he had been the assistant secretary of the Navy, right? And he chats it up with his contemporary across the pond there, Winston Churchill, right? And the two of them know each other, right? They're exchanging, you know, letters, correspondence. And Winston Churchill is the former first Lord of the Admiralty. Now, I don't know if you, any of you were around the military um, or you understand things like, you know, the Navy, right, or any of the services. But it, things like that are very, being in the Navy, it's not just being in the Navy. It's maybe it is for some people, but it, it, it's, it's a, a lifestyle. It's an ethic. It's a tradition. It's a culture, you see. So these two Navy guys, FDR and Winston Churchill, kind of hit it off because they they have this bond you know and um franklin Delano roosevelt of course is sympathetic to 
you know, the situation that Europe is facing in the sense that Adolf Hitler is actually rearming his entire armed forces against that the stipulations made up in the Treaty of Versailles, which we talked about. And um, but at the same time, you know, Great Britain, they're the ones who were actually having to face this, really. And, you know, the notion was for Winston Churchill is like, we got to stop Hitler because if we don't stop Hitler, then that means we're going to be in a second world war. Right. But everybody else in Great Britain is like, oh, Winston, sit down, you know, and stop drinking so much. Go smoke a cigar. Right. And because, you know, Winston Churchill had this reputation of being like kind of like what today we would call a warmonger, you know. He's going to get us into a war, you know, when he's too direct. We need, after World War I, we're so smart that we're going to prevent conflict by the ability of talking, right? And so, you know, you got people who are looking at Hitler and other people since Hitler, and you compare them to the guys where we're so smart we're just going to talk through this and everything's going to be fine. And I'm going to make that Stalin guy. He's I'm going to make him see things my way. And I'm going to make that Hitler guy see things my way. And other people are like, you're an idiot. It's never going to happen. You're going to wind up getting the, the other person the feeling like you're so desperate to make a deal that they're going to make it seem like you, they want to make a deal. And you're going to buy into it because you're so damn narcissistic. And then we're going to wind up a war anyway. Except we won't be prepared because you didn't want to rearm us because that would have seemed too benevolent, uh, belligerent, you see? So that's what was happening between people like Neville Chamberlain and who was to become the, um, the prime minister of England and Winston Churchill, the old war dog, you see? And that's pretty much what happened. That's pretty much what happened. The um, Hitler had this through, through this little party called there's something else that, you know, it's worthwhile mentioning um, as far as contemporary politics are concerned. We have uh, certain events that are usually used as um, analogies for certain things. Right. One of them is, is something called the Reichstag fire. Right. You know, the Reichstag is like their parliament building and um, you know, roughly like, I don't know, Congress, I guess. You know, the United States Capitol, if you will. And the Reichstag, what happens after Hitler comes into power is the Reichstag mysteriously burns. Right now, the biggest, which is a national outrage, right? it's a national outrage. And, it, and it's depicted as a national outrage that the seat of our German government was defiled and defaced by people who were trying to overthrow our government and they're so foreign that they need to be expunged and eradicated, right? So there are various stories to this, right? But the Reichstag fire is generally seen as what we call now a false flag operation, right? A false flag operation means that we have engineered something, the building, in this case, the Reichstag, to burn down. So we have somebody in mind to blame about it. Because once we blame them and we attach that person or that entity to this national outrage, then therefore these people are going to be toast. You see? All of them. And then we will have the, because of this emergency, the extra governmental, extrajudicial powers of an emergency to literally wipe out our these people who we have claimed is responsible for this, which just happens to be our political opposition, by the way. And that's how we're going to do it. So that was a very important event. And it's something that actually, in certain ways, you can draw a string to whether you believe in it or not. Uh, but it's a very important um, event in time, the Reichstag fire, all right? And um, Stalin, during the same period of time, goes on this gigantic purge, and he starts collectivizing all of the farms in Russia. 
So we've made the shift to Bolshevism and to, you know, Stalinist communism. And during this period of time, you have a lot of people from the Far East who are studying communism in France and in England, not the least of which Mao Zedong, right? Ho Chi Minh, who are learning how to be real communists. And they're studying Marxism. And Stalin is providing a European example of this, um, the example of which both of those Asian counterparts were going to say, we're going to do a better job than Stalin did by making it more rigid, all right, later on. Now, so you have the collectivist farms, et cetera, in the Soviet Union. Um, and also during this period of time, in the early 1930s, you have Japan, who is looking to expand itself into, well, China particularly, you see. And uh, Japan has already annexed the entire Korean Peninsula right after the Russo-Japanese War. So Japan has been completely emboldened by their victory in 19 over, uh, 1905 over the Russians, right? So you've got Japan who has entered the world stage as a world power. And not only that, but Japan follows up in World War I on the side of the British, fighting the, the, the Japan sent Japanese Navy destroyers into the Mediterranean to fight alongside the British, if you didn't know that, in the Mediterranean, which means that Japan now is part of the world powers, you know, which is still weird because um, I wasn't alive at the time, but it seems to me from my research that people were still pretty, you know, I guess the word would be prejudiced in a real racial sense. And, you know, you look at Asian peoples and you say, well, you know, they're not, they're not as good as us. They're not as smart as us. Their technology is not as good as us. They're short. They're not going to be able to fly airplanes, you know, all the rest of that stuff, right? Their eyesight's bad. And if you look at the kind of, if you look at the kind of um, restrictions to immigration that the United States has always had, it is remarkable and undeniable that Asian exclusion was predominant. And we did not want Chinese people. We had all kinds of the Giriac, we had all kinds of other exclusions uh, directed specifically towards Asian people. And this is like really racist stuff, right? Because you would have to characterize it as race. There's no other way to characterize it. All right. And uh, hang on a second. <laughs> Uh, no, I canceled two other programs that I had. This is good because it's a Zoom program and I'm just sitting here in my own room, you know? So, and so the thing here is that Japan, you know, if you want to look at it through their eyes, you had all of these European nations that God had gone down into, I don't know, the Pacific Rim, if you will, right? Like essentially between Australia and where Japan is. And, you know, you have the island archipelago, uh, now it's Indonesia, was called the Netherlands East Indies, right? The entire Malay Peninsula, right, was British, right? Singapore. And then, of course, French Indochina, right? And which obviously French. And then the Philippine Islands, uh, an American held protectorate a remnant of the Spanish-American War of 1898. You know, so Japan is looking around and saying, well, you know, we want to have a modern army. We want to have a modern navy. We want to be able to do our own manufacturing, et cetera, except Japan is an island that really doesn't have, well, practically anything in the form of raw materials. So it's got to get it somewhere and it's getting everything from the United States. And, well, not everything from the United States, but most of it from the United States, right? You know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, my father was telling me when they were cutting down the, the L's, 
right? In Manhattan, you know, they had the elevated trains, which I never saw in Manhattan anyway, except except up further north up in the island, right? And um, I'm talking about the elevated railways. And, you know, and, and they just cut all that high grade steel up um, and they put it on barges and they put it on ships. You know where they sent it? They sent it to Japan. And, um, you know, Japan needed it as a, they could melt it down then and make their own warships and all the rest of their stuff for war and everything else that they were doing. But they had to be imported from the United States or elsewhere. And, you know, as well as I do, that even today, there have been numerous examples where if you want to have some kind of sense of um, your own sovereignty, you can't be dependent on foreign sources of fuel of energy, of, of raw materials, right? This is another thing that is a direct line to many of the things that we're discussing today is the United States an energy independent nation. Does it have to be an independent nation? Uh, after Vladimir Putin invaded the, the Ukraine, um, was it holding Germany hostage that if Germany gave the Russians a hard time or sanctioned the Russians, that Russia was gonna turn off the, the gas spigots to Europe, now that Europe is closing down all of its nuclear plants and coal plants and is essentially dependent in a transitionary period on natural gas. And so you see, it's, it's just as strategic as it ever was. And that's the position that Japan was in. And then when we started actually later on in the, in the decade, started ramping up our sanctions and our, um, our complaints against Japan, over their expansionary militaristic kind of, you know, pro provocations in the Pacific, you know, Japan felt as though, well, we're going to have to go get our own source of materials because the United States, we, we have to plan for that because the United States may come to a point where they're going to cut us off and we need to be ahead of that. You see, so as far as the beginning of World War II was concerned in the Pacific, Japan felt as though, the United States, by its sanctions and its boycotts, to limit Japanese expansion was really a provocation that actually led to World War II in the Pacific, right? It wasn't Japan, it was the United States that was acting provocatively, you see? Whereas the attack on Pearl Harbor, of course, December 7th, 1941, was made necessary because of the unreasonable expansionist, hypocritical policies of the United States telling Japan it couldn't do this, that, or the other thing. And therefore they had to, they had no other choice but to invade the Dutch East Indies to get their own sources of supply of oil. And since we were, that was gonna mean war anyway, they might as well kind of like knock us off our heels to begin with. Then Japan could run around and do what it wanted for six months and collect so much real estate that was strategic to them by them, we would be involved in this major conflagration with the Nazis in our effort to help the British, then we would turn around in the Pacific and say, well, you know what, who cares about Borneo anyway? And all right, so we'll make a deal with you Japanese so we don't have to fight a two ocean war. And that was a mistake the Japanese made about us. So... What else we got from the 1930s? And well, another famous situation in 1933 was, if any of you have seen the movie, The, the Grapes of Wrath, right? We had the Dust Bowl, right? So, the, you know, this seemed like, see, there were no safety nets back then, you know? There were no safety nets back then. So people were truly going from, I get this program from certain photographers that I do, you know, um, Dorothy Lang, for instance, if you know who that is. And uh, she worked for the Farm and Securities Administration, which is another New Deal program. She went around and took all of these photographs that were really what the, the movie The Grapes of Wrath were actually based on. You know, like when you're looking at the Henry Fonda character and he's got these like 
the sand beaten, wrinkled, sort of weathery face and the, the little flat scrunchy hat. And they're driving a this beat up old car that's being held by bailing wire. You know, that was all that's the stuff that was going on. The Midwest is destitute as it was because of the dust bowl. People actually had to go and they had to start traveling west. You know, California being, um, you know, the largest agricultural state, even then, it was at least you had a promise of getting a job, I don't know, picking peas or something. And, and it is really part of American folklore, all of this, you know, um, there's a lot more to it, you know, but that's, there's a very important period of time. Every one of the things that I've got on my bullet point list today or something that could actually be an entire presentation in its own right. So Social Security is enacted by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right? That becomes a big deal. And um, you had famous architects during this period, also Frank Lloyd Wright. And others, uh, some of the biggest Art Deco masterpieces are created in the 1930s. Rockefeller Center, um, um, amongst others, just right here where we live in our, our proximity. And nineteen thirty five. A seminal event happens in a place called Nuremberg, in Germany. They're called the Nuremberg Laws. Right now, this I'm speaking of things that we could do an entire presentation on. So now you have this real racial segregation, this cultural segregation, where the Nazis had made the argument that Jews were such a parasitic force on German society, frankly, any society, but speaking of Germans, then the, the Jews are responsible for every negative aspect of anything that happens in any system where Jews are introduced. So Jews are, they're the antichrist, they're the they're the acid, um, that Jews are incapable of anything productive or positive in any way a society would measure those things. They are only responsible for caustic degradation and destruction. And therefore, we are going to use a national profile, essentially canceling them and, and saying, well, you can't, we don't want your uh, Jewish teachers teaching our children, right? So Jewish people who had been esteemed doctors and lawyers lost all of their civil service positions um, and you couldn't get a job. And also you couldn't, have Jews interfacing with people who weren't Jews, right? So Jews weren't supposed to be talking to non-Jewish people. Jews had to actually shop at designated times where other people who weren't the nefarious Jews wouldn't have to be offended by the presence of Jews. And um, of course, if you were if you were caught fornicating, a Jewish person was caught fornicating um, or having any kind of relationship with a non-Jewish person that was punishable and you were humiliated publicly, there were laws against it and all the rest of this. Um, so this is a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. And you know, it's very hard, this, this period of time we're living in right at the moment for people who are old enough to remember World War II, right, let alone the Holocaust, to actually have things come, they would say, full circle and say that I can't believe this still exists the way it, it I mean, this is, it, it's beyond comprehension. It's beyond comprehension. If you spoke, if you've spoken to an elderly Jewish person, 
lately. I mean, like in the last, since October 7th. Um, and some of the stuff that's going on in our own country. Um, it is, it is, is probably the worst thing that can happen to a person to, to recognize um, that where they finally felt safe, they, Jewish persons, collectively and individually, um, now that there is such a rise of people who is kind of like a throwback, a throwback to a very dark and dangerous place and sensibility. I work with senior citizens all the time, so I know this. <clears throat> or maybe you actually have some of the, some of the same sentiments yourself. So the Nuremberg Laws, you know, and I'll tell you, the Nuremberg Laws, I, I'm not going to say that we're responsible for the Nuremberg, or we, the Americans, but one of the things that was very popular in the United States that we championed, right, and then the Western world championed, that the, Jew, uh, that the Jews became the ultimate victim of at the hands of the Nazis, ultimately, was two things. It was... Um, something called eugenics, which was a real darling kind of a thing that we had here in the 20s and the 30s, you know? And that means that we're, we're so modern in our sensibilities of creating an engineered society, then why don't we just apply that to humans and say that, well, some people are you know, this person, this person who was born with Down syndrome, it's like, what are we keeping them around for? They're not going to serve any useful purpose. They're just going to take up resources. So they, we, they should be euthanized, right? Or uh, maybe this population of people is having too many kids. So maybe they need to be sterilized. Or maybe we have these certain attributes of what society would perceive to be ideal qualities, right? And then we're going to maximize the reproduction of those maximize of those what we perceive to be positive qualities. And um, and we're going to make it all seem very scientific while we're at it, by the way. And so what do you got? You got prejudice dressed up as science. Um, and then, of course, even before that, preceding that, was the granddaddy of them all, Darwinism, right? Uh, Darwinism is the survival of the fittest. So that means that it's, you know, if you've got two antlered male animals, like, beating their heads against each other to get the one female, and then one of these antlered males, like, you know, runs away because he can't take it anymore or he's injured, then the dominant animal is the one who is left to mate with the female and propagate his bloodline. You see, so what this did is it created this scientific notion that is like the central dogma of everything, certainly in my lifetime, right? Which is that, well, nature says that somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And nature says that the person who's going to lose deserves to lose because the person who won or the entity that won is, is genetically better and nature has wired it in that they are going to be successful. So it's in the nature of things. So you see, so between that is applied to people now, right? And that is called social dogma. Now you take social Darwinism, you add it to eugenics, you have the Nazi party as it is applied to their own society, right? What are the, what are the ideal attributes that we want? Now, of course, for the, for the Nazis, it was the Aryan, right? This Nordic, straight-nosed, tight-chinned, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, Etc. 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 Right. The ideal of which would have been, you know, people from uh, I don't know Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Right. Which the Germans saw themselves closest to, and their secondary cousins would have been the English. 
and um, and everybody who didn't look like this, you know, people who have a Semitic background, certainly, well, they were characterized as not fitting this model, you see. And because Jews were seen and other uh, entities were seen, like um, African, uh, like Negroes, were seen as racially different, right? So Jews were seen as racially different, a different blood, a different set of DNA, right? The other. You see, so whether or not a Jewish person actually converted to Christianity or not didn't matter. What if they, cre uh, they switched over to Christianity like five generations ago? It didn't matter. But because for Nazis and Nazi ideology and their pseudoscience behind it, you're always going to be a Jew because it's in your bloodline and you can't help being evil because you have the bloodline. You see, when that was another thing that gave license to what happened, you see, so the racial stuff the eugenics and also um, social Darwinism. One, two, three, right? When do you take science and make it seem like science is unfallible and it's pure and you have a white lab coat on and you're holding a clipboard and therefore we have determined that this is accurate and this is correct and everybody else like, well, if it's science, it must be true. And you ask yourself, I mean, and this was brought to the height at these times, you know, in many cases in our own country, but to its most nefarious ends, of course, in Nazi Germany. And then you ask yourself, well, how many times today, like in our own time, our own postmodern time, are people walking around with, you know, the equivalent of the white lab coats? And we're science. And because we're science, we have determined this is the truth. And therefore, everything else is non-truth. You see, so there's a direct line here between now and this period of time. Different names, different subject matter, same technique. The Spanish Civil War or something was happened in 1936 becomes a dress rehearsal for World War II for Hitler, etc. They're able to test out all of their new hardware. You know, you have the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, right? Jesse Owens. You see, so now what Hitler wanted to do with the 36 Olympics was to turn that into a showcase to show that while the rest of the world was suffering in the Great Depression, right, that Germany has emerged victorious and we are all working. And we're all prosperous. And not only that, but all of our people are fit and healthy and well-fed and they're happy. You see, so the idea is that we, Germany, must have a better system of government than you. It's better than capitalism. It's better than communism. You see, so it was a big, you know, we call these things Potemkin villages, essentially. You know, when you actually clean up a certain area so that the visiting people, it's kind of like, not to sound too cynical about it, but it's like what Gavin Newsom did with San Francisco a few weeks back when the Chinese were coming, right? They actually got all of the homeless people off the street. And, um, you know, when they power washed everything. So the place looked great while these VIPs were there. And then it just went back to all of these, you know, people shooting drugs and stuff on the street. And, you know, in Germany, actually, they did put people to work. And Hitler was actually using socialist policies to drive all of these programs, getting people to work, you know, building roadways and building infrastructure, as we would call it, and all the rest of that stuff. You see, of course, it was all mandated, right? You didn't have a choice. I mean, in the 1930s, I mean, if you were a young man, or if you're a young woman, you were, you were obliged to, mandated to join a Nazi youth program. You see, so this is very important. Whereas now you have these kids growing up to be good little Germans, where uh, young ladies, young maidens were taught to bear children, and be strong 
right? And young men were taught to how to be soldiers and to father children. And um, you really didn't have a choice. And by the way, it was your job to rat out your parents if your parents were talking at the dinner table saying, I don't know about this Hitler guy or my best friend, you know, is Jewish and I don't like what just happened to him. You see, then it was the children's job to rat you out. You see, so this brings up another direct line to, you know, some arguments that people have to, about today is that who's actually raising our children and whose children are they? And so therefore, if it's just your job as a parent, just to essentially just bring them into the world, and, but the government takes over from that point, you see, and the government is going to decide that your children are actually, their allegiance isn't to you, the parent, it's to the state, right? Now, we ha we've had these discussions, we, I mean, collectively, we, not maybe you and I, we, but this is something that's a direct line to here to then. And it's very interesting stuff. Like I said, every single bullet point I have for you today is something that could be an hour and a half discussion by itself. And um, the Hoover Dam is a great example of uh, New Deal funding, et cetera, and work, right? The Hoover Dam. Uh, that's also something that's completed in 1936, I think it was, right? Um, Of course, 1939 becomes a famous year for Hollywood movies, right? Can you think of two of the names? I'm thinking of Gone with the Wind, and I'm thinking of um, The Wizard of Oz, right? So it's kind of like the golden age of, you know, Hollywood stuff and all the rest of that. But going back a little bit, Amelia Earhart vanishes over the Pacific Ocean in 1937, right? So that was, you know, still something that's, you know, anything like that's always a mystery. You know, whenever you got somebody in their, in their height, their apex is like, boom, gone. It's kind of like a JFK kind of a thing. It's kind of like, geez, you know, uh, what really happened to them and what would the world have been like if they were alive, especially with JFK, actually. But the, the thing is with Amelia Earhart is that you know part of the speculation is geez did the japanese nab her because was she really flying around the equator right she wanted to fly around the world and she didn't want anybody to say that she was wimping out because she was a woman by going at a northern latitude or a southern latitude which if you know what a globe looks like and i assume you do means that the actual circumference is different yeah, you know, she wanted to go around the equator. Where is the biggest? So nobody could say that she wussed out. See, so and it was really a trip around the world. And that area took her around um, that Pacific region where I was talking about before that the Japanese wanted, right? And I'm talking about you know around Australia and Papua New Guinea and all the rest of that. And that was already areas that. You know, it was potential. The idea with the Amelia Earhart thing is that the whole world trip of Amelia Earhart was really a government funded spy mission that the Japanese figured out and they essentially grabbed her, you know, because she was a spy. Right. Now, this is completely speculative. Right? As far as I'm concerned, she was looking for Howland Island and she couldn't find it. And she and she wound up in the drink. You know, that's the most likely scenario. Oh. Oh. The Golden Gate Bridge is opened. Uh, I think it was 1937. That's a pretty big deal as far as architecture is concerned. You know, uh, it's a fascinating story, really. Um, becomes the longest bridge in the world. Uh, surpasses the George Washington Bridge. Um, which was opened in 1931, and the Golden Gate remains the longest bridge in the world until the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is completed in 1963, right? And the Golden Gate is the first bridge to actually have a safety net as it's being constructed, right? Which was a tremendously innovative, right? A safety net. And um, there were 19 guys who fell off the bridge that landed in a net. 
and it was called the Halfway to Hell Club. And, um, you know, it's just these little innovations. Another thing that happens right at this period of time is that the Hindenburg takes a trip over to the United States, right? The Zeppelin, right? The airship Hindenburg, you know, and it's this a new form, not a new form of transportation, but it was a way for the Nazis to show the flag also, you know, that they had these two big swastikas on the um, the empennage of the aircraft, which was, you know, at the, the two vertical stabilizers. And so I, I, I've spoken to senior citizens who told me from, Brook, from um, Bridgeport that told me that they were let out of class so they could come out and see the Hindenburg go over. Right. That's a pretty interesting memory, I guess. And of course, the thing explodes over Lakehurst, New Jersey. Um, you know, the Hindenburg, there, there's two kinds of gas that can be used that are lighter than air in an airship like this. It's not a blimp. It's, it's a rigid dirigible. And it has these gigantic bags in it filled with lighter than air gas. Right. So there's hydrogen and helium. Right. And they were using hydrogen, which is extraordinarily flammably. The question is, why were they using hydrogen? And the thing is, is that the United States, for whatever manufacturing uh, reality, kind of controlled the market on helium, which was a lot safer uh, as far as explosion is concerned. And we refused to sell it to the Nazis because it was a strategic material because Zeppelins could be used as airships to recon a tour or to patrol or that sort of a thing. So we were already were sanctioning that strategic gas. Uh, we wouldn't sell it to the Germans. And so that's why the Germans had no recourse but to use the much more dangerous hydrogen, um, which of course you saw the the way the ship in those photographs, you know, oh, the humanity, right? So after that, what seemed like a viable means of, I don't know, transatlantic transportation, after that, it was like, you know what? I'm taking the Queen Mary, thank you very much. And, you know, that's what happened to airships. Hitler annexes Austria. The world watches. And then he wants the western portion of Czechoslovakia, referred to as Sudetenland. So the idea is, if you think back to the kind of terminology that uh, Putin used regarding eastern, what is it called, the Dumba region of Ukraine, right? Is that, well, all of those people are ethnically Russian. So therefore, it's our responsibility to protect them and repatriate them. It was the same exact argument that was used by Hitler in 1937, 1938, that the people in Western Czechos Czechoslovakia in the Sudeten region were, were ethnic Germans and they were being mistreated by the Prague government. And therefore, it was going to become necessary for the Germans to repatriate these people, right? So... Seeing himself as a peacemaker, Neville Chamberlain comes in, right? Now, Neville Chamberlain is in the position now, 1938, of being like the leader of the Western world. It's the same position that the United States president has been in since, the, since after World War II, right? And so Neville Chamberlain goes and cuts a deal with Hitler, right, which is brokered by Mussolini in Munich, called the Munich Pact. And um, it gives us another one of these big, you know, these big things to look at that we compare things today to. And the Munich Agreement said that Germany can actually walk in to Western Czechoslovakia and essentially annex it, the Sudetenland, the so-called Sudetenland, you know, and, um, and that's all that Hitler wanted. You know, he's got Austria. A number of other things that were erased uh, as far as the Treaty of Versailles was concerned. And we could do a whole presentation on this, of course. And But the thing is here is that Western Czechoslovakia was just handed to Hitler to avoid war. 
right? And Neville Chamberlain goes back to Great Britain. He's got a piece of paper in his hand. And he says, we have averted war in our lifetimes, you see? And it's the Munich Pact, which is just this little handwritten thing and signed by Neville Chamberlain and Adolf Hitler saying, you know, we, the German people and we, the English people, you know, we will vow to resolve our differences without going to war. Right. And as far as Neville Chamberlain was concerned, that was a sigh of relief because, wow, you know, look at that. We've averted what had to be averted, which was another First World War, you see. Now, of course, we look back at this today and we say, well, you know, Neville Chamberlain was an appeaser. Right. So in other words, what he did was he just emboldened Hitler by being so obviously desperate to sign any deal which would give the Western world what it wanted, which was not another war with Germany, that they'd be willing to do anything. Right. And um, Neville Chamberlain came back and he was like, yeah, yeah, I looked into Hitler's eyes and I can see that I could trust him and all the rest of that. And of course, Winston Churchill was like, you're an idiot, you know. And so the what happens now is that right after that, <clears throat> Germany just, oh, by the way, you know that it, it, it's this meeting dividing up Czechoslovakia. Czechoslov the government of Czechoslovakia wasn't even invited to the meeting. How's that? They weren't even invited to the meeting. You see, that's how important these world powers, Germany, Italy, England, felt as though they didn't even have to invite Czechoslovakia to their own party about their own country being cut up, you see. <clears throat> and, um, and then, of course, Germany just goes in and takes the rest of Czechoslovakia. And after that, everybody knows that Hitler can't be trusted, even Neville Chamberlain. And um, you're on a direct line now to the beginning of World War II, which begins, of course, on September 1st, 1939. Um, England and France had created a, uh, a defensive pact with Poland, saying that if somebody attacks Poland or threatens their sovereignty, which could only mean Germany, of course, um, then we, England and France, are going to come to your defense. So that was designed as a defensive measure to try and intimidate the Germans from attacking Poland, you see, because that would mean essentially war. So Germany turns around and makes a deal with their arch enemy at this point, Russia, and they have the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. It's a non-aggression pact. So in other words, if Germany goes into Poland, Russia is going to stay on the other side of the border and allow Germany to do whatever it wants to do. And when Germany is done taking Poland, then the deal is, is that Stalin can have the entire eastern half of Poland. And Stalin makes this deal because he's not ready for war anyway, and he has really no choice. And all right, let's take half of Poland, you see. So September 1st, 1939, Hitler does it, expecting Neville Chamberlain to be like, well, you know, to write a strongly worded letter of protest, you know, but really do nothing, which Hitler is ready to accept anyway. So what? They're angry at me, you see. But this time, um, Neville Chamberlain gets on the radio on September 3rd, 1939 and say, you know, we told the Germans they had to leave by this time. We have heard nothing from them. Therefore, it's my duty to tell you that this country is now at war with Germany. So September 3rd, 1939, World War II is on. Um, additionally, a bunch of scientists that had to run out of Germany, right? They were chased out because they lost their jobs. The, the, these Jewish scientists mostly, right? Uh, who did these things called, you know, these, the kind of physical mathematics that is required for nuclear computations, right? Which Hitler, because most of the guys who were doing these computations, including guys like Einstein, were Jewish, Hitler didn't like it because he, he considered it Jewish science, right? So these scientists were able to get out of Germany in the early 1930s, mid-1930s, 
seeing the writing on the wall or being expunged because they couldn't teach anymore. And they landed in places like um, England, France, in some cases. And in our case, we, Albert Einstein at Princeton, right? So a bunch of these guys get together and they, they come to Albert Einstein and they write this letter and they, and they give it to Albert Einstein and says, you need to bring this letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt telling the president that it is possible to create via nuclear fission, a bomb of unimaginable explosive power. And Einstein's like, look, I'm a pacifist. What are you coming from me for? Well, you could bring it yourself. You see, and what happened was they said, nobody knows us. Nobody's going to listen to you. You, Mr. Einstein, are kind of like a hero. They'll listen to you. So Einstein actually delivers this letter, you know, and nobody reads it anyway. It gets, you know, OK, we'll give it to the president. Nobody even sees it till like another year later. Right. Which afterwards, the Manhattan Project begins. And um you know, there's about a thousand other things, but that took up an hour and a half. And I want to thank you for joining me. And um, a great terminal side check, targets acquired and completely explained. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I'm glad my voice held out. Um, and if anybody's got any questions that wasn't answered here or something you want to ask, just, you know, just contact us, send an email, and I'll make sure I get back to you. Right. Until then, I want to wish you a uh, happy holiday and a Merry Christmas and I guess New Year, too, uh, coming up soon. Right. We have another program before New Year. I don't remember. Nope. The next one we have is January 3rd. OK, so God right bless after. all of you. <laughs> all right. And I'll see you very. I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Merry yes, Christmas. Happy New happy Year. Again. Thank you. you. Great talk. Thank you. My pleasure. As you all know, um, I will be sending out uh, the recording that will be on YouTube, hopefully later on today, if not tomorrow. Um, and if so, I will see the, all of you on January 3rd at 2 o'clock, and I'll be sending that out in the new year. Um, wishing everyone a happy and safe holiday. Art, I hope you're feeling much better, and we hope to see Thank you then. <laughs> all right, everyone, have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.